Hello, Dimitri. How are you today? I'm pretty well, Fabrice. How are you? Fine, fine. Okay, so tonight, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to ring the bell for all the, for all the notifications. We have weekly guests from all the rock industry and its subzoners, Fabrice. Tonight with us, yes. tonight with us, the singer and guitar player of the band The Deer Hunter, Mr. Casey Crescenzo. Thank you, Casey, Perfect. for being here. Thank you. Hello, yes. Casey. Hello. 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 Thank we you very so happy. much for being here tonight with us. It's yeah, a great pleasure. Here. We are really it's a great we are... pleasure. To... Sorry, it's a great pleasure to have a mastermind of uh, rock music in general. Yes, no, you are. You are you are the, <laughs> the, A, the A and the W of your group. Well, I I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah, yeah. that. I That's definitely true. I don't want to dis discredit any of my my band members yeah, or the people sure, I've had sure. luck with. They it's I I didn't really even know like chord names before I started playing with other people. So <laughs> like really? all of my th yeah all of my theoretical knowledge of anything and my comfort of anything that edges into theory, you know, um, yeah. is purely based on my experiences with other musicians and especially the guys who are in my band now and still even now um, learning new things from them. So I appreciate that very much, but I'm very lucky to be surrounded by such talented people who are also willing to be part of conceptual projects that they do or don't necessarily yeah. care about the concept of, but yeah, I've been very lucky. So I appreciate that very much. Your orchestrations are uh, very difficult to be played. So mm. you have to have a great band to do it. Yeah, it's true. So that's true. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and as, begin. We are yeah. Sorry, oh, and as we are talking about bands, we will start tonight's show with your favorite top five albums. And uh, it would be very nice for us if you can uh, put the albums in a specific row. If not, okay, that's not an issue. I think that be just due to the way that I have, I guess, experienced music in my life, the the best way for me to rate albums for myself is the big ones that came in and had a huge influence on me at a point in time and set me down specific paths. So um, I think if I'm working completely backwards, I would say that the last band's album that had a huge influence on me would probably be the band Elbow and their record, The Seldom Seen, Seen Kid, which I think is like from 2009. Yeah, but yeah, I didn't like hear it. I didn't hear it for a while. Uh, and my bandmate, Rob, showed it to me. Oh, that's, that shouldn't be happening. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, I, no, ne no I never do. I never talk to people, so this is like, <laughs> what what is the right etiquette? Um, no, there we go. Okay. There's the air. There's the air. Don't plane. worry. Um, yeah, but but that one really, uh, like, there is something about that record that felt very progressive in the way that it it reminded me a lot of like, uh, I guess of you know, Peter Gabriel and yeah. some of the music that was progressive from the 70s that edged out and then like that crossover of progressive and pop. But that was the last record that really, I think, had a profound effect on me. But and then if I'm working backwards. I'm trying to think. Mm -hmm. So I would put that as like number five, as okay. no, the number okay. five influential Elbow. record. Uh, number four, I'm trying to think. You know, when I was first playing with the band I was in before The Deer Hunter, which was called The Receiving End of Sirens, and that was like my first real introduction to heavier music in general, like, I guess, the, you know, like hardcore. Yeah. That was my first introduction to bands that really listened to hardcore and like friends of mine that re really listened to hardcore, because what I grew up on as I work back, you'll see was different than, than that. But that was a really defining moment in my songwriting because I think the concept of rage in music became clearer. Like I had better examples of aggression and uh, just rage in general personified through music. 
time that I spent with that band. So I think that the the um, refuse the shape of punk to come um, was probably the next one that really hit me in a way that like records hadn't hit me. It's like uh, what I'm basically describing is that there these aren't necessarily the records that I even of course point to as the biggest inspirations, but they yeah, were like yeah, real it. defining moments. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That like was one of my first interactions with like the the variable of aggression that it's it doesn't have to narrowly just be like there's either anger or there's happiness and those are the two ways that music can be and mm -hmm. that even aggression on its sleeve what could be presented or or what's presented as aggression on its sleeve if you dig into it can actually be much wider or, or cover much more emotional ground um yeah. and i felt like th that band did such a good job of that but also it it made aggression fun in a way yeah. that w i hadn't necessarily been exposed to and it, and i know it you know there's nothing necessarily top to bottom inno innovative about that band but in my life it really was something innovative um before that say, sorry casey yeah. but let me say that aggression is a big element in your music but in an amazing way of um of a balance with all the other elements with happiness with uh, all the other um, elements of your concept with hunter of i course. appreciate that i appreciate yeah, that. but hunter yeah. is one aggressive hero yeah 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 totally, I would, totally. I, he's definitely he's ignorant without being evil he's ignorant and naive and aggressive and that's, that's like true. can be that can be a dangerous combination to yeah, be aggressive yeah, yeah. and naive you know um even in I his childhood even in his yeah. childhood yeah, in your first true. acts yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, i must awesome. tell you that that's true. i must tell you that uh, i've heard um, your concept back uh, in 2005 2006 some, something like that at uh, it at its very earliest stage and I was um, terrified by that hero because uh, I was trying to see what was going to be with that kid. Right. And um, I found some elements uh, of myself in him and I was really terrified. And that's something amazing uh, that connected me with Do you music. mean, what was the part of it that was ter was the part of it terrifying that you felt you felt relatable to this character, but you also saw the potential for darkness in that character. So it yeah, makes yeah, you wonder. Yeah. Like, the way, the yeah, way that, that... Uh, he has lived the loss, especially the loss of his yeah. people, the loss, the sentimental <laughs> loss and uh, the physical loss of some people of his uh, environment. Mm -hmm. And the way he interacted with that sentiment was something very dark. And uh, I think that's, that that's, yeah, yeah. you know, I think specifically when it comes to loss, I'm probably, I am probably injecting more than in any other facet in the story, even more than the romantic facets of the story. I think the fear of loss and the fear of death and the sort of things that those, those feelings can conjure in you when they are so present, when those fears are so present. Um, I think that that is such a strong has such a strong effect on me that it's probably it, translating into that character a lot that's probably one of the yeah. things that i grafted on is this almost like almost like a chicken with its head cut off <laughs> running away from death like that's kind yeah. of what it feels like it's yeah. like well you kind of already dead but um <laughs> not not that defeatist that sounds really really dark i don't mean it that dark but there is that is a huge problem i have emotionally and just metaphysically yeah. if that's even a thing overcoming or approaching is i feel like i hear a lot of people talk about how okay they are with death and like yeah you know when you die you die and it's so hard for me to get to that place that i just keep on exploring that in almost every project that i think of it's it's built into it in some way and it's and definitely a it, huge part of him i mean he's at times literally running from very obvious <laughs> um you know metaphors for death and yeah and, and the uh, most terrifying and the most terrifying thing is that your concept is um a 
literature one, but a uh, real thing, not the sci-fi one, like other right. ones. So right. it makes the hero so real for us and his sentiments so real for us. I appreciate that. I think, I, I think that I never, I didn't think about it while I was writing it or go or approaching it in general. Um, I didn't think like, okay, I'm going to do a concept record, but it's not going to be about what concept records usually are. I think that I, I don't know. I don't even know how to ex explain it. It didn't seem, and it still doesn't seem like it's necessarily too different because there's still, there's some records like, what is there? Is it SF Sorrow? Um, the Pretty Things. Do you, um, you we know, know the record? band? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, but... I think it's SF Sorrow, or I forget exactly which one it is, but somebody told me long after I had like committed myself to what this story would be, like yeah. I think it was actually one of my band members at the time. He showed me that record and, or showed me pretty things and I really liked it. And then he showed me that record and I dove into the story and it was similar to the story that I well, was writing, but well. only 50 <laughs> years earlier. And it was, you know, and I think there's archetypical things that a lot of people will like, uh, you know, I think it's funny that I'm saying this because the current thing I'm working on is science fiction, like oh, the, yeah, the yeah, current project that. that I am working on is science fiction. We'll talk but, about that later. Yeah, yeah. But course. the goal is always to make it the that's just a backdrop. I guess that's what <laughs> the end what it comes down to is like if you make the heart of your story something that that is sci-fi it's not relatable but if you make the heart of your story something that's just a regular human emotion or something that you can graft onto anything it doesn't matter at all what the backdrop is whether it's the canvas it, it's completely just the canvas and so <clears throat> that's definitely my approach with with this science fiction story but by the way, I want to finish my. Before yeah, yeah, I of course, of course. Yes. Finish my, <laughs> we are, my we are in number three. four. Okay, we are in number. Yeah, four. Where did I? Number four. I was at. So wait, I did. Number I did four? elbow. I did. Yeah, I think I'm at number three because I did yeah, elbow yeah. and no, no, the no, shape of punk three. to come. Sorry, in number in number four. What was the title of the album you uh, you picked? I think it's. I believe it's the refused, and the record is called the shape of punk to come. I'm gonna be really, really embarrassed <laughs> if that's not the case. <laughs> the shape of. And I have one question after that. <laughs> yes, it is that. That is the okay. Name of the okay, record. no yeah. cheating. Okay. No cheating. <laughs> okay. Before before telling us your number three, do you feel in the Dear Hunter project? Do you feel uh, like an analog father or a digital father? Do you do you mean in in due to the uh, production in a way of well, which album? I would say are, that. Are you making analog productions or digital ones? Oh, well, analog. I think that that's that's the 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 goal for me is to replicate emotional responses that I have been given by other pieces of music, okay. and the music that still has that relationship with me seems to usually lean analog whether or not the sounds that they're making are trying to sell you on the fact that it's analog, it just seems to usually be minded in that direction. Yeah. Okay. And also the first recording system that I started with was my dad's reel to reel Tascam eight track. Uh -huh. And that was my, in my bedroom. It's like every time he would get a studio upgrade, I would get a studio upgrade in getting the last. So when he went to digital, in the early 90s and started using, I think it was Cakewalk uh, before it became Sonar. He was using Cakewalk Pro Audio. He gave me the, like this Tascam and a little four track mixer. And it took years for him to convince me to start using a computer. <laughs> like he was well into it. And I was very much like, no, I'm just doing it on this. I understand how to use this. And then as you know, I, was lucky lucky enough to work in different studios and work with different bands and see the constantly evolving technology and, and have access to it. Um, having no money at all to begin recording albums, it's like you have no choice but to do it digitally. And some of the yeah, of course some of the first stuff I was doing, the the 
like act one and act two the the hardware on both of those records is so so bad the hardware that <laughs> i had access to was just so bad um but i don't know i don't know if i could make a differentiation i can say that e with even things like software instruments i ever if there's ever an opportunity to not use them and to have a human being play something that's always, always the direction i'm going to go in okay. and and it will feel and i think that would if i had to pick one that feels analog that feels analog but maybe i'm not understanding the question fully no no okay okay <laughs> so totally understood so let's go back to the top five so After this is that, we are yeah. Yeah. number three yeah yeah <laughs> i think i think that the 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 uh i think record number three <laughs> I, I think I should just just say it, even though it's it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure, but <laughs> we like it's not that pleasure. guilty of a pleasure. It's only a bit of a guilty pleasure because it doesn't. No, I mean it's I I I love the guy, but um, passion and warfare, Steve Vai's oh. passion and warfare. Of course, <laughs> uh, that that as like a composer, as as somebody who is a who like is interested in composition, is interested in recording techniques as a creative extension and not purely a technical one and then is is also like for for lack of a better word or phrase like turned on by the full gamut of emotions that music can portray a record like that that goes everywhere possible um melodically harmonically just generally like that when I heard that, it really did sound like alien music. Hmm. Um, and it didn't feel as exhibitionist as other like guitar records that I had access to at the time. Like, I can't even remember a lot of those like guitar heroes that I was shown by other guitar players in the early 90s. But the only ones that really stuck are, are stuck. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Vai really stuck and still somebody that I'm, I have a lot of interest in. And um, Joe Satri Satriani was one of my like first concerts, so I think I have a nostalgic place for that. But Passion and Warfare and then the fi Fire Garden are kind of tied in records that came out at a time when I was young enough that they had huge, profound effects on like my interest in composition. Okay. Um, before that, or or just just around that same time as a singer. Um, at the, around the same time that I heard it, I became uh, or heard Steve Vai. I also started listening to Bjork, mm -hmm. and the the production side of things that she had going on in her music, and the way that every record, um, even though there was this very clear thumbprint that she was putting on her music, that you can always tell it's Bjork, obviously because of her voice, but. Mm -hmm. um, every record had something about it that was handled completely differently. And you could tell that um, even the, the concept of making an album, not, not a conceptual album, but the idea of going to make an album would be treated, could be treated creatively from before you even start writing it. And, and not to necessarily have a story, but before you even start writing the record to kind of like wrap your head around what are the things on this record that I want to, do differently? What are the things I didn't do well on the last one? What are the elements about it that I could be more proud of this time? Like all of those questions seem to be something that I could hear Bjork asking herself, conquering, and then improving upon every time I would hear a new record. Um, and so I think the one that really hit me was Vespertine. Um, that record really, really hit me. Um, but I, the the record that had, I I would say the most effect on me entirely yeah. in my entire life. Yeah, yeah. Is number one. <laughs> so number the, one. The, the number one, and it's tough because it's really tied three ways from <laughs> the same artist, from the same artist. But if I had to choose the one of them, it would be, uh, it would be the uh, I think. I think Axis Bold is Love. Jimi Hendrix's Axis Bold is Love. Mm. Um, 
I, when, when I was like eight years old and I really started playing guitar for the first like time in my life, taking on a hobby and it being obvious that it was more than a hobby and I was spending a lot of time doing it and sitting in my room and just like enamored with every new thing I could learn. My dad brought home two CDs and he showed them to me and he, I didn't know what either of them were, but he showed me the cover for Are You Experienced? Then he showed me the cover for Flying in a Blue Dream. Um, and he was like, just pick one of these and go off and listen to it. And I was like, that Are You Experienced cover looks crazy. I'm <laughs> yeah, going to take that. I'm yeah. going to go in my room. And then from the age of eight to 13, I did not listen to another artist other than Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> like, I, I got all of his studio albums, all of the weird bootleg studio albums, every single live performance I can get. And this was when all you had were CDs and bootlegs and all of that. So I think he only had three official studio albums, like actual yeah, official yeah. released studio albums. I had something like 36 CDs <laughs> of Jimi Hendrix. And they weren't like different versions of Bold as Love and Are You Experienced? Yeah, yeah. They are, um, why can't I remember the third one? The, or the, it, was it the first one that came out? Access Bold as Love, Are You Experienced? What is that other record called? Cheat, cheat, Thodori, cheat. <sighs> yes, I don't yes, want to yes. cheat. I don't want to cheat. I shouldn't cheat. No, no, I, I should know this. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, good, good. It's uh, uh, but but yeah, those uh, I I had I had those three records, and then yeah. just a slew of other things like Crash Landing was one of these. Or Voodoo Soup, they like the the Hendrix Hendrix Estate always does these like re-releases, and in the '90s was a really good time for unearthing and digitizing yeah. tapes, you know. So so he was like my guitar teacher hmm. growing up. Like I would sit in my room. I didn't have a guitar teacher. I would just sit in my room with my guitar and his CD playing. Didn't matter which CD, and I would just sit and learn everything about the way he was playing wow. his parts and where the bends were happening, like the, the general way he approached his yeah. guitar, where his hands like sat, I would watch videos. I just, I was so obsessed that for <laughs> my fourth, my fourth grade class assembly, like year four, I dressed up as a hippie with, <laughs> with headbands and everything brought my guitar to school and played the star spangled banner well, and th did some of it with my teeth and i was maybe like time, yeah. <laughs> i was like nine years old i was it was probably horrible but i was like nine years old um like i i recorded a bunch of covers trying to sing like Jimi hendrix when i was you know 12 or 13 which is really <laughs> funny to hear uh but also his, like, there's these artists like that where they give you a really good doorway. There's always yeah. this really good doorway. And for someone like Steve Vai, the doorway is that this is someone who can play guitar in a way that's very unique and also very technically proficient. But that's just the doorway. And then if you're interested in everything else that an artist has to offer, you get, you get to pick all of these wonderful gems out of the full, I guess, breadth of what it is that they are actually interested yeah. in. Like Steve Vai isn't just interested in, in how fast his fingers move. No, no, no. He's very much interested in, you the know, song. the the song and the symphonic experience of a listener. And that started to become clearer to me as I was listening to Jimi Hendrix and, you know, hearing what he had access to at the time and the soundscapes he would make for you to listen to. Um, that felt so unique and completely from him, entirely from him. They weren't like this, they weren't this mimicry of something else going on at the time. And even when they were, when it was covering a song like All Along the Watchtower, it was representing this raw material in such a drastically different way for yeah. the listener that the experience, I mean, I think I read somewhere that Bob Dylan started playing it in that <laughs> style because it was like, yeah. <laughs> that's really the way it should be. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that was, Jimi Hendrix is the most <laughs> profound artist impact on my life, for sure. I think that, I think that the national hymn of America should be played 
as Jimmy played it. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, it's so, it'd be much better than a, like a flute, just a single flute or somebody yelling it. It's so much, there's so much emotion. Reality. But yeah. Yes, it, it's, yeah, it's a very therapeutic <clears throat> version of that, uh, that piece And of music. Casey, the third, the third album of Hendrix, of Jimmy Hendrix, was Electric Ladyland. Electric Ladyland. How yeah, can yeah, I forget yeah. that one? <laughs> okay, the okay. Studio don't, is don't worry. After. Oh, okay, don't worry. Okay, we led it. We led it that part, and uh, you'll no, be don't. okay. No, don't. It's okay. You'll be perfect. <laughs> Why? Don't bother. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. Yeah, yeah. People can know I have a horrible memory. <laughs> <laughs> and how can you remember all those notes? All those orchestrations, uh, it's amazing. Maybe I'm like an idiot savant. Maybe I can't remember anything other than notes. Oh, I'm not good no. at lyrics. I'm no, not very really good at lyrics. This is why I call you mastermind. This is why. <laughs> Music mind. Oh, yes. So let's go to the second part, another okay. difficult one, which is about your top five singers. Okay, yeah, it's very different list. Very different yeah, list. Yeah, of course. Um. Let's see. I'm trying to think of where I should start. Well, the first, like the the first stuff that I was listening to, really was was like when when I was a little kid, my mom would put on the oldie station in the car, and she would always sing along to it and always sing harmony to it. So the first stuff that really got me was like doo wop and and uh, oldies. But because she was such a big Beatles fan. The first vocalist that really, I think, had an effect on me, and I decided early on that that he was my favorite Beatle was Paul, and oh. just his voice. And she would she, like hearing him sing, hearing her sing along to it. That just was like I don't know. It was the first voice I really, really took note of. Um, so that would be like five. I think that would be number five. Um, And that's why just because just because it wasn't it's not something I necessarily emulate. It's not something I necessarily point to as like that's what a singer should be. But it was the first time that in the context of just music and it was the it was like the early Beatles stuff, like really poppy. I want to hold your hand stuff. But that was the first voice that really I, I glommed on to and and still like gives me almost similar to a like listening to his voice is similar to listening to like my mom sing yeah. a lullaby or something like that. Mm. Um, but then let's see, the next one I think would be Brandon Boyd from, uh, from Incubus. Yeah. Um, that was a band that I was introduced to uh, that lived actually like one town over from where I grew up and met them or anything like that. It was just like, it was cool because When I was young, you would hear about this band and they had, you know, like a weird little following and they were funky and quirky and obvious yeah. stoners and stuff like that. And then they got huge, but he was his his just his pitch and his control over incredible. his voice was incredible, like and still is incredible. And yeah. like uh, also just I think that band is a great band. Um But that that was, I think, hearing uh, "Make Yourself," hearing yeah. uh, the record "Make Yourself," everything before that was really cool too. But that was the first one where I, it was like his voice was at optimal power. It there there was less like of the humorous stuff that they were doing as like a funk band before that, and it was just singing yeah. incredibly throughout the record and harmony too. Like his approach to harmony is is pretty unique to to him, and I I really like the way he keeps things kind of simple but can utilize dis dissonance uh and and resolve um really comfortably and minimalistically just in points where it matters uh yeah. it's not something i do i definitely go over the top of <laughs> harmonies but um yeah. you're, the, uh, you're totally a queen fan by your oh music. my god yeah 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 if you want to guess who number one is then you can go ahead and we guess know, who number one we is. know that we know that every time yeah. you sing backing vocals or you do the vocal layers we know, know that I is know. brian may just... roger taylor freddie mercury and yeah. all the stadium and all the wembley stadium <laughs> okay it's, it's true just yeah. um just i think i was recording harmonies for something the other day and i was talking about uh I was going to do a falsetto one. I was talking about Roger Taylor. 
and uh yeah i mean uh yeah i'll get i, I will definitely get there for sure yeah, i will course. get there what what am i on three or did i three. Three. Yeah, three. Uh, number yeah. three is right now yes okay um trying to work backwards in my mind yeah. uh it's, it's tough well man oh well in that same time another a perfect like flip side of the coin was uh chino from the deftones deftones um, wow. amazing production I, in vocals amazing production i've seen them live a few times and it's been you know it's been one way or the other but i have seen them live when chino has done things with his voice i just didn't think possible <laughs> uh like there's there's something about I don't know. There's something about his voice that startles me. Like the thing, the the level of ferociousness that he can achieve. He's you know like banshee like almost, yeah. but not banshee in in a uh, Led Led Zeppelin kind way. of banshee yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but not yeah, so vintage. I, I, More than huh? a, not so vintage one. Something right. like a, not new metal. Exactly, no. but uh, no. something something different, something uh, his. It's way more. It's way like there's a lot of new metal where the growling and the screaming, like yeah. like for instance, like Lincoln Park. You can yeah. tell that the screaming in the vocals is is a calculated effect. You can tell it's a calculated effect. It's like the chorus is here, so I'm going to sing right here. <laughs> I know how to scream perfectly these notes, like. Um, or that kind of singing generally, but like Chino, it feels, but it feels like this level of primal that he's super in touch with. So he can make the pitches remain beautiful. He can like push his voice just a little in one direction or the other, just to make a chord throughout the entirety of the band sound like for the purpose of sounding this way, sounding yeah. awful. Like he can make your skin crawl with his voice, <laughs> but then really there have been some moments of like, complete and utter beauty from his voice as well so hearing them both at the same time was really cool because you know as much uh power as brandon boyd can put behind his voice it's just a completely different thing than than chino's voice um yeah. and the the next number two though like yeah. takes that idea way further which is um uh, mike patton Whoa. Um, faith no more mike, of course F faith no more mr, mr. bungle Bundle. tomahawk yeah. Uh, Phantomas, so um, Mondo Kane, uh, like if there's somebody who can chameleon shapeshift to anything <laughs> possible, like even things that are inhuman, like I, I know he's done voices for video games and shit like that. So um, his his voice, but I also love his bands. I don't know if, if you guys have heard California from Mr. Bungle, that record, um, California. No. Back uh, not, not ma me. many years ago, many years ago. You no, should check it out. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should check it out. You will yeah. hear like, oh, okay, yeah. Obviously, Casey really likes these guys. Um, <laughs> okay, I, uh, but he's not. Um, it, there's, there's a, there's this. I don't know. There's this classiness to his voice when he wants to croon. There's this like disgusting quality when he wants to be ratty and nasty. There's a surreal quality when he wants to whisper, like everything he does, every emotion he tries to conjure with his voice, he knows the exact sound, how to create it. And it just is natural and, and muscle memory for him. And yeah. from a, for like the concept of a cinematic singer, like if I, if not that that's the thing that exists, but I feel like that's what he is. He he can produce horror. He can yeah. produce like every genre <laughs> of feeling. It just yeah. comes out of him. Um, but yeah, number one is Freddie Mercury. Like of course. for when, everybody. <laughs> when I, when I heard when I heard um, my brother got a boombox when we were really young, and uh, and he brought home the uh, the soundtrack for Wayne's World. Yeah, and it had Bohemian Rhapsody on it. And I that scene in the car, that scene in the car, it's, yeah. it's yeah. like the, the car. scene for so many people. <laughs> like it's yeah. just, you know, cause my parents were huge into, into jazz fusion. Like 
rock of the 70s and 80s yeah. and 90s and actually well rock after 1969 basically just was irrelevant to them yeah, the yeah, thing yeah. that they really got into was fusion and uh jazz and bands you know they but even in the 60s like they they were the king crimson fans they they weren't like the beatles they were fans of because everyone was beatles but both of them were way more into outer uh, outlier music um expanding the so life. so the first time i heard queen was wayne's world because it just wasn't my parents <laughs> music <laughs> yeah and when i when i heard his voice i'm sure it was it's the same for everybody it's almost like it like it makes the hair on your neck stand up it it feels like something you have you already have heard a thousand times but you've never heard before and you're just yeah. like there's something that i'm i'm like th that's one of those voices i'm just grateful to have been exposed to and to be alive at the same time to hear it mm -hmm. um it's absolutely a voice that I reference internally when I'm going to sing a part uh, that I'm like, um, you know, like, like, a, uh, there's a song on act three that's called the poison woman that has this ending of the chorus has this like swoop up. That's a pretty large leap for me from one note to the next. Yeah. And I was, I was tracking it and tracking it and tracking it. And I just was not able to do this pitch jump. The only way I was able to do it was just by mimicking Freddie Mercury as yeah, best yeah. as I could. It yeah. was like, it was even down to the physicality of his whole like, like, <laughs> like ball your fist and flex. Like, and then the second I did that, it was like, oh, there it is. And even yeah. it's little moments like that. It's just like he knew something about his own body that I just don't know about mine. So <laughs> anything I can I can learn from him is great. Um, you have to yeah, wear like, a white T-shirt to do it. <laughs> it's true you do and a little uh, leather band right yeah, here. yeah of course and then and maybe my mic stand, stand. <laughs> my mic stand needs to be way smaller oh. um, <laughs> just that thing that he used right he could like yeah, lift yeah. it in and out of any mic stand it was the part and the mustache mic. did you say the mustache is that what you said <laughs> yeah you are almost there you are almost there almost. <laughs> <laughs> okay so, Jesse. now sorry for the reason. Oh, sorry, sorry, so, yes. it's totally obvious in your music that you like Freddie Mercury and you like uh, oh, yeah. the vocal uh, layers. Um, yes, big the time. First, like the first thing I was introduced uh, by you, it's the vocal layers of Dear Hunter. That is something amazing. Uh, you must do you. so Thank many you. tracks, so many tracks in your vocals. Yeah, a lot of tracks, a lot yeah, of tracks. I know that, I know that. You do that uh, wall of sound all over the place. Uh, and I think that uh, the most backing vocals are yours. Am I wrong on that? Yeah, the, um, I mean, yeah, I would say even on the songs where I bring my mother in and um, Tivoli, my girlfriend, I should call her, I, I wanted to call her my wife because she's <laughs> my son's mother and we, yeah. base, we we live together. We consider ourselves married, but we haven't actually gone through that. Um, You're a woman. Essentially You're... my wife. <laughs> uh, yes. um, even when I bring them in to sing on it, I find that I am still singing probably even in that scenario, 50% of the background vocals. Yeah. Because a lot of it, a lot of the ideas also happen generally around my range. Like a lot of them are beneath my vocal just to kind of pad or provide some foundation. Um, but I've really enjoyed bringing in, uh, bringing in other people to start to, I guess, alter this obvious timbre yeah. that's me. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't do it because it's like uh, I want people to hear a thousand me's. If I had access <laughs> to a choir, for some reason, if my studio just had a live in choir of really? super different vocals, I would I would want to bring them in. But like anything I do, it's like if I can't hire, if I can't afford to do it the way that I dream of, I'm going to learn how to do it myself. Oh, um, that's a good approach. It's the it's the only approach that'll get anything done when <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> when I know that I mean not too many people are like yeah it seems like a good idea to invest my money in this in this record of a generally unknown band so they can have a full <laughs> orchestra play on their on their yeah, CD yeah yeah <laughs> like that that I lucked out on even that that wasn't the record label putting that money in that was a fan of the band Ooh. who is a very accomplished person his <laughs> name is Kevin Pereira and he. 
um, was a thank presenter. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Seriously, yeah. th massive thank you. Yeah. Massive thank you. He, the act four and five wouldn't have an orchestra if it wasn't for him. And on top of that, too, like if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for this orchestra being willing to do this record that they hadn't really done something like it in the past. And they like, you know, I guess for lack of a more eloquent way to put it and not sound like it's purely financial, like they they cut me an amazing deal to be able to work with their orchestra. And because of their orchestra, the connection they had with the studio in Berkeley, California, allowed me to work in a historic studio <laughs> that I never would have been able to work at like yeah <laughs> it's uh i you know sometimes it does feel like life is a simulation for me because i keep on being given these strange needle in a haystack moments where just by chance this thing that i'm trying to do which is completely pipe dream-esque happens to happen and i know when i take a step back there's nothing i really uh, did objectively to accomplish it i just really got lucky with the help of a lot of people who who saw it as beneficial to help me or just saw how passionate I was about it and were like, if we just help him, maybe he'll shut up about it. I don't know <laughs> what drove everyone to help did me. You? Did you? Did wild. you? Did <laughs> you? Did no, you shut up? No, no, no. <laughs> we know that. Maybe No, no. Maybe... I only I only go further. That's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem. Is I made an or like I did migrant and that was like Oh, I want to have a string quartet on here. I've never actually just had a string quartet. And so I do so I do migrant. And and then after migrant, it's like, okay, well, I learned how to write for a string quartet. What do I want to do now? Well, the next obvious thing is I'm gonna try and do an entire like 40 minute purely orchestral piece of music. Sure, I can do that, right? <laughs> and luckily I'm sur I was surrounded by people who didn't know enough about that to say, like, that's not a good idea. That's not gonna generate you a lot of money. But like the jump between writing for a string quartet and then writing for a full orchestra and then, okay, well, I've written for a full orchestra. Now I want to write for a full <laughs> rock band and full orchestra and let's just slam all of it together. Okay. Like, okay. It's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. It just maybe, keeps on snowballing. It keeps maybe, on snowballing. Maybe real life is Dear Hunter's world and we are living in his concept. <laughs> Think about oh, it. Think about it. And in He's section. much more creative than I am, then. <laughs> He's much more creative than I am. <laughs> Please put me in the credits. <laughs> okay, Casey. Uh, yeah. Let's go to the third part of our show, uh, which includes some questions we have for you. Okay. And our, fir our, first, our, sorry, our first question is, um, tell us any, anything you may want for a honorary astronaut uh, release. Oh, yeah, so... Um, the context Some details. for that, that EP, the, the, oh, do, like, do you want me no, to no, talk no, no. about... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Tell us anything you may want. Sorry. Sure. So I've had a few people ask me, like, is this what you're going to be doing now? Is this, like, the style that you're going after? Is this replacing the deer hunter? And the, it, no to all of those. Like, it, it was just that I've been working on the current deer hunter project now since 2017. And it's been going through a lot of different, I guess, eras, if if I can put it that way, like, because this project is not just records, because I'm working on things beyond the albums, it's been a really long go of it. And last year, or this year, um, we were supposed to release an album, like I'm sure a ton of people were supposed to release an album. So we had all of these plans, like everybody had plans. And we were working on the record really early this year. And everybody went home for a little break because we don't live in the same town. Everybody flew home for a little break. And then COVID really started, like in the U.S. Or the restrictions really started in the U.S. And so uh, one by one, we started to watch all of these things that were really gestating for a very long time fall apart and um get delayed and like the best case scenario was that something got delayed a full year the worst case scenario was that something just got canceled, canceled yeah. and i watched one thing after another happen and um you know like i wasn't gonna go online and complain about it or something or or cry woe is me it's like the smartest thing for me to do is to wait until 
the scenario is right to put out a record so that we can actually promote it the way that a band like ours has to promote a record. We aren't a social media savvy band. Mm -hmm. We're not a hip band. Like the way that we keep interest in our listeners is by playing for them and by putting records out. We have to put a record out and then we have to promote it and we have to tour on it. And that's just the way we are supposed to do our records. So once it became clear, like, hey, you're not going to be able to do any of the promotion for this record. I was like, okay, well, then we should wait to release it until we can. And honestly, emotionally, it was a lot for me to, to work through. Um, to just try and look at things completely logically and not be like, no, I want people to hear what I'm working on. I want them to see what I'm working on. I want them to see what the logo looks like and what the art style for this project is and all of these details. And it was just so clear that that couldn't happen that I was like, I have to make something. I have to prove to myself that I'm still capable of making music at all and releasing it and finishing a project was something that it was just like, I have to finish a project. Something has to be done. So. I had some songs that I had kicking around for a little while that I was thinking, I'll just re-record these songs. And no one's heard them. They're just demos. I'll re-record them and I'll put that out as myself because it wouldn't make sense for me to interrupt this like waiting pattern of the deer hunter and say, hey, I've got these songs that are kind of like 70s, <laughs> shimmery, prog, pop like it's ELO meets Roxy music yeah, yeah. meets like a, a, a bunch of other shit. Um, it wouldn't make sense for me to say, Hey, I know we're headed in this direction. We've been working on this project for a while, but just so we can release something, let's get together, record these songs. So I decidedly did them on my own, um, worked on them for a while. And I had the name honorary astronaut kicking around. And as I was re-recording a couple demos, I started writing music, that was just for the project itself. It wasn't like a spare demo. It wasn't a spare idea. It was just new stuff that was coming up. And uh, I knew I wanted to keep it narrowly in that general style of like music that, that kind of music that I listened to um, for lack of a better, I don't know exactly where, what ELO falls into uh, hmm. in that realm. It's like bubblegum prog, you can almost call it or like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, arena, like arena, prog, arena rock, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's something like that. Like there's there's really cool classical and progressive elements of it, but at the end of the day, a lot of it is actually disco. So it's like, what do you what do you <laughs> yeah. actually call it? Um, but yeah, so so entirely the idea was very small. I just want to take some songs. I just want to yeah. release them, and I and and prove to myself, even whether or not anyone likes it, that finishing a project is still possible because I have so many <laughs> unfinished. Um, and that was really as far as I thought it. And then the visual aesthetic of it just kind of felt in line with this idea of like someone who's really interested in becoming an astronaut, but the best they can ever do is go to space camp or something like that. And, <laughs> and, and that concept like really developed into, uh, um, what I think that music, if I do, when I do more honorary astronaut music, it's very much its heart is centered in the you know humility of a very ambitious person, and those are the things that I want to explore in that, I guess, name um, yeah. because I also feel like that's something that is more comfortable for me to explore on my own necessarily than with a, a band. Yeah, and I had. You know, there's three guitar players in my band. Um, I don't really end up writing a lot of the single note guitar parts anymore because I want to open this, you know, I want to open the floor up to everyone in my band to be, to have ownership over the things that they're playing. So as time goes on, like there's just more and more and more ground that I am opening up for people to be creative and I, it works, it's working really well for my band and what we're trying to accomplish. But for me, it's just the interest in playing guitar. It's been so long since I've just written guitar parts that I wasn't necessarily thinking if I would step on someone's toes by writing them. Um, I've already written the rhythm. Do I, should I not write the lead? Should I not write this? Um, 
So removing all of that shit and it's just like, I'm in a room, I'm alone, I've got these ideas, let's see where these ideas end up. Yeah. And that's the thing that I'll show people. And that, that was really it. Um, and it was done in this little vacuum of time between like, uh, I guess, uh, workloads for the deer hunter. And, uh, I also did a music video for it. That is not out yeah. yet. That ah, is really fucking another one embarrassing. from the lyric one. It's, oh, it's really embarrassing. It's, <laughs> it's really, uh, I should, I, uh, if you, if you won't show anyone i think this will be out on black friday but if you if you guys wouldn't mind not showing anyone i'll send it to you well, just so you can not. see of course of course just oh, so you can thank see you. how it's so ridiculous of let me course. see if i can no 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 it's very special it. for us well just, just wait until you see the video you need an astronaut we will oh, sure. see it uh, later on yes of course. yeah Wait, I, let me, uh, who would do that? Well, yeah, I, I don't want to interrupt this, but I will send it to you as soon as we're done. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah just, of course, of course. Yeah. And we'll okay. send the feedback. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Please, <laughs> in, uh, in, order, yeah. in order all the fans not to be jealous of us, we will cut your statement in the editing. <laughs> no, no, tell them, let them know. No. Let them know. Let them know that we, are, yeah. that we are fans that uh, okay. are very happy now <laughs> so <laughs> i don't me... know what you're gonna think of it it's pretty okay. funny let me say casey that um your choice to have a personal release a solo release of this honorary astronaut is the most wise one because it's an amazing album but it's oh, not your hunters you. one yes yes i really liked it i thank i you. like your music i like your way to to do the orchestration that's why i totally like whatever thank you do I'm not uh, an objective fan. <laughs> I'm just a fan. I appreciate it. I okay. appreciate it. So let okay. me clear that. But uh, I think that um, I I might be a little bit disappointed if it was a Dick Hunter's one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, so it's it, very at wise. best for me, at best for me, that music could only fit on a Deer Hunter release yeah, yeah. similar to the color spectrum. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That was very clearly like, hey, each one of these things is very much its own thing. But because like, yeah, it 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 just wasn't gonna work as a Deer Hunter record, and um, that which is interesting given how wide the Deer Hunters catalog is. But I appreciate you saying it because I really did feel that way about the music and the the one song on there that had been there, there's the song Gold was a song that I had written a while ago thinking maybe it would be a deer hunter song but even that it's like it's just gl glam yeah, rock yeah, enough yeah, yeah. to to not be yeah. something that this mm. even the drum parts that i write it's like <laughs> i don't want to doom my brother to play that drum part. He, he would write something so much better than it so it's i appreciate not, you saying that it's not a hunter's soundtrack i can't imagine exactly. hunter to live inside this honorary astronaut's world. <laughs> no, it would be it would be yeah. a weird time. Yeah, yeah of course. So uh, let me do Dimitri, me do sorry, sorry. Casey, yeah. I have a proposal yes. to say to you yes. live. Dimitri doesn't know it. As we are about one hour, the, the show so far is about one hour. And okay. we have we have prepared so many questions for you. Will you be able next week to have another Skype for the second part of our okay. interview? Of course. I mean, I because can keep going we, we now, have, or we, we have many, go. we have many questions that we want for you to answer. I'm happy to. I'm and happy to. Uh, I think for the fans, it will be nice to to do with you because you are a very very easy going uh, guy. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so I'd be happy um, to. I I would be oh, happy to any t any time you guys want to. Really, the uh, full transparency. The reason that earlier this week didn't work was. One, mm -hmm. my studio was a complete mess. My yeah. studio was a complete okay. mess. Like it had a bunch of gear in it. Like mine. Two, like mine. <laughs> yeah, well, not really though. No, mine was like, mine was the kind I just didn't want people to see. Okay. I just didn't want people to see. It was just filled with okay. stuff. Like there's so much, uh, the house that I live in is, uh, is this, it's kind of more like a commercial building than it is a house. It's not really a commercial building. But it's where I was building my guitars. My guitar shop is upstairs. My studio and its live room is here. And then where we live is like just attached to it. It's, it's not like huge or anything. But 
we've been doing so much moving around that my studio from time to time becomes like a dumping zone, yeah. um, which is a little weird, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but it, it does become a dumping zone. So I came in here and I was like in my underwear, unshowered, <laughs> sitting here, not like naked, but like, okay, good. I'm good to do a, a voice chat. And then I had a very narrow window of time before I had to have a call with my manager. <laughs> so it was like, can I shower and clean my room with enough time to actually have an interview right now? Probably not. One hundred thousand views. It would be <laughs> something amazing. But yeah. you're right. It probably would be more entertaining yeah. if I was just <laughs> derelict and sitting here. So, so Casey, Dimitris, if you don't, if you don't mind, yeah. let's uh, ask him. Let's uh, tell him one more question. Okay. okay. And, and we will do the second part. Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to yeah, do a yeah. second part whenever you guys want. Huh? Okay. Th thank you very much. We are so happy to have you oh, as our no. guest because uh, you are an amazing uh, co-talker. <laughs> yes. 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 Hey, so, if, if you ever so, if you ever come to Greece, we will go and drink ouzo and uh, uh, wine love, and cipro. Would, you said Let's, you were really excited about. Yes. It. Yes. 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 Because I want to know if you okay. have any songs ready for Act Six. Ooh. Oh. Uh, or your concept I well the the next record which is part of this indigo child concept is in, entirely written and nearly entirely recorded and there is a song actually on my screen right now behind oh. us that I am too close too close to us that oh. I am working on that it's it's a song that I'm working on right now and that I actually just got a bunch I mean you could see all the tracks it goes wow. on and on and on so and on. many tracks okay. <laughs> so many midi so many midi but, so many vocals so many so but, many <laughs> uh, I'll tell you the big kill this one right now is synth tracks there's something like 36 synth tracks as yeah. it stands wow. um but I'll tell you so With Act Six, the the story of Act Six, and this was something that I had been thinking about for a long time before I started writing Act Four and Five, was so detached from the narratives of one through five that it, yeah. and the specificity of the story of Act Six would have made a record version of Act Six feel almost like a a greatest hits. <laughs> like it, it, it would have almost played out like a greatest hits yeah. of motifs and things. And I'm trying, you know, there's no easy way for me to describe this other than when I was thinking about this change, I was thinking about this, this, this character dying at the end of the fifth story. Yeah. And yeah. the next story being about after that, being yeah. about after that in some non committing to any religion's idea of an afterlife or anything like that. It's, and also not trying to make any statements about an afterlife, but in a mildly fantastical way without getting too fantasy driven, it yeah. being an afterlife story yeah. and the way that I had written the story initially, I, it just didn't make sense as a record. And I thought about this change from life, to the afterlife. <clears throat> and I thought the way I could best represent this change would be to change the mediums the story was told in. So I s had this image in mind of Hunter yeah. waking after death. Wow. And, wow. and the, the state of being being completely different from one moment to the next. So I thought the best way I could possibly convey that idea was with a film that started with a character waking up. And the idea in my mind was this is someone who has just come from a musical existence to a physical existence. And that change being similar enough to a idea of life in the afterlife, like yeah. the, the status change being so drastic from one to the next. And I, I wrote with my my friend and collaborator, Eris Bader, we wrote, oh, my God, <laughs> yeah. I am not showing you me. I am no. not showing you me. I'm so sorry. Where do I start? No, no, no. no. Are, I am you, so sorry. You had, I was just you, talking. You had to push play. <laughs> oh, 
And you know that the fans will also Todori, see Todori, what Todori. you just uh, show us. Okay. That's totally Dear Hunter. <laughs> It's like the, the I'm, <laughs> there's well, so much. We have we have there's... the first notes of Act Six. Yes, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, no, not six, not six. No, not the six. Indigo Child. The Indigo Child. The Indigo um, Child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's exclusive so, yeah, so, for us. So it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very but much. But you're Thank also you going to see that so video. Don't, that. don't let me forget to send you that. No, video. no. Oh, there's an entire screenplay basically. There's like a 150 page screenplay for Act Six, uh, that has been finished for the last few years we tried pitching it to a few people we there's a ton of concept art done for it like we really worked hard on this and mm -hmm. it's a story that i love but it's it would be so expensive to film and to do a a a, re, a record version of it only i don't know if i could do that without it being just musical redundancies for like 70 or 80 minutes um that being said i i don't think i could leave it unfinished and i think i've got a threshold of time in mind where if it turns out that i can't create it the way i really want to where the musical component would just be the score then i think i would reproach the project I would try not to change the story, but I would try to reproach the project and and think mm -hmm. like, what's the way I can make this record so it's not so redundant. But I got so excited about this current project that mm -hmm. I'm working on that it basically, from 2017, it took all of my focus and um, I can't like I don't even know where to start with it. I <laughs> to the to the point where I've written so many pages of lore like mm. that no one's ever going to see <laughs> no one is ever going to see this stuff but like maybe the maybe maybe i don't know but we, like, we can uh, ask your wife we can ask yeah. your wife <laughs> she knows send, all of it we, we will send her a secret message you will never know about it <laughs> let me know so we will learn thing is like, everything <laughs> if you did ask her she would know every answer she really yeah, would. I know, every, I know. <laughs> yeah yeah so in, awesome. in part in part two we can have her too <laughs> yeah maybe maybe if she's not too shy she's pretty shy yeah. but we'll yeah, see okay. if no, i can no. con convince her to wander in okay Casey, Casey. in uh, Thank sorry you. sorry yeah. Dimitris, yeah. in uh, in part six of the story uh, will you have any guests or not if i make if i make it a record you're saying yeah, yeah. if I do yeah yeah because as it was I mean that's um, one option one yeah. option is doing it as sort of some in between kind of media that is is like maybe I can't make a film but maybe I can do something that's almost more like a play as a record like a you know an hour and a half two hour play as a record that dances between hmm. musical pieces and dialogue and stuff yeah. like that but musical one I I uh you know, I but, didn't. I've never yeah. had many guests, but I, I don't see why I would. Thank awesome you, Casey. Guys. Have a great Thank you very much. day for you, night yeah. for us. <laughs> yes. Sleep well. I'll I'll talk to you guys in a few you days. You too. Okay. Stay safe, and uh, we'll meet you next week for the second part. Bye bye. Sounds okay. Good. Take care, fun. guys. It was fun. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Casey. Bye bye. So, Dimitris, we had the pleasure tonight to have here with us in our show. The singer, Mr. Casey Crescenzo. Crescenzo. Crescenzo, Crescenzo. It depends on your Italian pronunciation, Todori. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it was it was a very very easy going guy. I enjoyed the conversation so much. Uh, according to my opinion, it was one of the best guests we have so far. So we have a very special surprise for you. Mr. Casey Crescenzo will be here in our show next week as well. Because we have too many questions to ask him about mm -hmm. Dear Hunter and the whole concept of Mr. Hunter. So don't forget, subscribe here, ring the bell here, and watch all the other episodes of In the Air Tonight, our weekly broadcast with amazing guests from all the rock industry and its subgenres. 
So, totally. And also, sorry, Dimitris, also don't forget to send us any comments for anything you may comment need. Comment here, comment here, yes. comment here. Anytime. Comment here. Anytime, anywhere. Okay. So, Fodori, until next time, with Casey again. Again. With good the, night. Good night. Yes. And see you next Tuesday, as always. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.